Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Jack Douglas. We're driving through New England in one of the most beautiful of these United States. The time is early September, Indian summer, the prelude to another unforgettable autumn. In a week or two, the youngsters will be back in school, so we're going to have to hurry because there are things to see and things to do. People to meet, people to listen to, people to talk to. But above all else, the majesty of autumn is at hand. Autumn in Vermont. The city of Boston is the gateway to the northern New England states, and as the crow flies, it's only about 186 miles from Boston to Montpelier, Vermont's capital. While staying in or passing through Boston, most vacationers take time out for a memorable and almost sacred side trip, a visit to nearby Lexington and a chance to pay tribute to Lexington's Minutemen of the American Revolution. And some words are never forgotten. Stand your ground. Don't fire unless fired upon. But if they mean to have a war, let it begin here. Here and at Concord, it did begin. The revolt of farmers and shopkeepers against a mighty European power. The Minutemen made their headquarters in Buckman Tavern, this attractive structure so well preserved to this very day. Also on the Lexington battleground, a huge stone marker has been placed on the spot where the midnight ride of Paul Revere finally came to an end. And this, known as the Hancock Clark House, is where John Hancock and Samuel Adams were sleeping when aroused by the night rider from Boston. But these are vacation memories for some other time. Right now, we've decided to drive to Vermont, enjoying Massachusetts and much of Vermont itself en route to the capital. The State House at Montpelier is among the most beautiful of all we've seen. Admiring the Gold Dome are these visitors from Evanston, Illinois, Mrs. John Burke and Mrs. Jerome McCardle and the youngsters. In the bright sunlight, it's hard to look at that golden dome without squinting. Where to stay when in Vermont? Well, in the vicinity of Stowe, the Trapp Family Lodge is very well known. Yes, the same Trapp Family singers who at one time concertized throughout the world. Maria Trapp, her husband and children, bought this chalet farm in 1941. Later, when their singing career ended, they converted the chalet into a guest lodge. Now a sample of yesteryears by mother and daughter, an Austrian yodel. Vermont was the last of the New England states to be settled, and the earliest permanent settlement was established in 1724. Here at Grand Isle, some 60 years later, Captain Jed Hyde, a veteran of the Revolution, built this cabin, considered the oldest log cabin still standing in its original condition. And various members of the Hyde family were to make this rustic cabin their home for nearly 150 years. And note the small delivery window, also used as a rifle outpost. Most people marvel that a log cabin could survive the elements for nearly two centuries, but toughness is an inborn characteristic of this Green Mountain country and its pioneers. The Green Mountain Boys, they called them during the Revolution. Ethan Allen was their famous leader, and they sang a song which said in part, we owe no allegiance, we bow to no throne, our ruler is law, and the law is our own. It has been said that most great deeds have been performed in small places, and near the town of Bennington took place the battle of the same name. General John Stark, leading a combined New Hampshire and Vermont force, shouted, there are the redcoats and they are ours, or this night Molly Stark sleeps a widow. 
This enormous monolith commemorates that historic battle of August 16, 1777. The tide was finally turned that day when Green Mountain Boys, under the command of Colonel Seth Warner, arrived on the scene overland from Manchester. The Battle of Bennington was really the end of the road for General John, Gentleman Johnny Burgoyne. Seven weeks later, Burgoyne surrendered at Saratoga, New York. The Bennington Monument reaches skyward 306 feet, one of the largest stone structures of its kind in America. An elevator ride to the top attracts tens of thousands of sightseers each year, and the elevator operates daily and Sundays. The mere mention of stone is enough to send us to Barry, just a few miles southeast of Montpelier. In this instance, first impressions are deceiving, for this quiet little community of about 12,000 is the site of the world's largest granite quarry. The quarry has free guided tours daily except Sundays from May to October. Let's listen. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome on behalf of the Rock of Ages Corporation. You're standing on the edge of the world's largest monumental stone quarry. This is one of a number of granite quarries owned and operated by the Rock of Ages Corporation throughout the United States and Canada. In addition to this quarry, we have two other fully operating Rock of Ages quarries located on this hill. We have quarries in Wisconsin, Oklahoma, Quebec, New Hampshire, and other parts of Vermont. This quarry has been in operation for more than 100 years. It's 350 feet deep, has a surface opening of 22 acres. The quarry is a little over one quarter of a mile from end to end. The deposit we're working here runs approximately four miles in a north-south direction by two miles in an east-west direction. The granite penetrates the earth to a maximum depth of around 20 miles. It's been estimated we can quarry here for the next 5,000 years before exhausting our supply. Yes, we heard him correctly. There's enough granite here to quarry for the next 5,000 years. No, this isn't a rummage sale. This is free granite, and visitors are invited to take away as many chunks as they like. Most vacationers are satisfied with a souvenir chunk, but you're welcome to all that your car and tires can carry. While you're in Barry, you'll want to stop at the Maple Museum to sample the byproducts of Vermont's most famous export, maple syrup. Well, looking at these maple goodies, you'll have to admit that this museum is really different. And its owner, John Shelby, is known as the Maple Sugar Man. And at your request, he'll make up candy assortments spelling any name or greeting you want. Maple sugaring is one of America's first and most interesting industries. Listen. Each year in Vermont, we tap about two and one half million maple trees in the spring of the year to produce about one half million gallons of maple syrup. We tap only the sugar maple because there isn't enough sugar in the other maple trees to make it economically worthwhile. The sap starts running in the spring of the year when the sun is high enough, in late February or early March, when we have warm days and freezing nights. And during the day, the sun will warm the tops of the branches, creating a vacuum and the sap, under pressure from the roots, rushes up to fill the vacuum. Then at night, the contracting of the branches causes the sap to return to the roots. This cycle may continue for as little as two or three days to as long as six weeks. A tree has to be about 40 years old before it can be tapped, and then it only produces an average of one quart of finished syrup per season. And it takes about 40 gallons of sap to boil down to make one gallon of syrup. The Indians were the first to discover maple syrup, and they tapped the trees by cutting the V-shaped gash in the tree and driving in the wooden peg at the bottom. The sap would run off the peg into containers, which they made by hollowing out pieces of log. And here we would have one of the early containers. The next step was this handmade wooden spout and handmade wooden bucket. This bucket had to be soaked for a couple of weeks each spring to tighten the stays so that it wouldn't leak. This is the tin bucket, which doesn't leak, but it does have the disadvantage of rusting. Today, on 85% of our Vermont farms, this galvanized pail and spout is used, and for the first time, we have a cover to keep out the leaves, 
twigs, and other foreign matter. This is the plastic bag, which has many advantages, such as it has its own cover, it's light in weight, and transparent, so at a glance you can see how much sap has been collected. The one disadvantage is that small animals, such as chipmunks, can chew holes in it to get at the sweet sap. This is the plastic tubing, which is still being experimented with. A line of this size connects about 25 trees, and then it runs into this larger tubing, which runs into a central collecting station or sugar house. The only trouble with the Maple Museum is that it's awfully hard to drag the youngsters away. They get dreamy just looking at the samples, so you decide to use a little diplomacy. In other words, you bribe them with a trip to Santa's land at Putney in the southern part of the state. You tell yourself you're doing it just for the kids, but before this day is over, you'll be one who won't want to leave. Now watch this. Dear Schmear, it's my bottle. That's right, son. Ouch. Santa's land daydreaming of Christmas. But once on the open highway again, you're glad that this is autumn and not December, that the meadows are free of snow and the trees are still heavy with richly colored leaves that have yet a few weeks to shimmer and shine before they fall. For autumn, like Christmas, comes but once a year. We'll continue. <laughs> The people who live in this Green Mountain state say that it's nice and big and small. Well, the state is one of the ten smallest in size, but since the population is less than half a million, the natives feel that Vermont is as big as the big outdoors. You can hike for hours and even days without seeing a trace of civilization. No billboards, no advertising, just people like yourself, such as this couple from New Jersey, enjoying what Vermonters take for granted. And as you hike along, you'll run into numerous artists, such as Mrs. Eileen Camp. I really enjoy getting out in the early fall to paint here in Vermont. The trees are beginning to turn, and you're getting the bright reds and some of the yellows. It's really exciting. It's only just the beginning to, of the, the early autumn. It begins to whet your appetite for what's to come. A few months or a few weeks from now, rather, you'll begin to get the vivid reds and the bright oranges and the yellows. Whether you are an amateur painter such as I or a professional, Vermont is a wonderful place to paint. of the mountain trails, you'll probably click your camera like crazy to take back home pictures you'll always want to remember. A solitary fisherman with a pond all to himself. The angler is Peter Sykes. Well, I think without a doubt, we've got the best fishing in Vermont here than you can find anywhere in New England. Uh, we not only have darn good stream fishing like this one, but we have many ponds offering fishing not only for the expert, but 
for the everyday vacationer. We've got fishing for everyone in the family. I think somebody could come to Vermont and spend their entire time, entire vacation, just fishing. Pete is right. Hundreds of fishermen, women as well as men, come to Vermont and do absolutely nothing except fish one pond and stream after another. You know, Indian summer is the ideal season for writing. The temperature is perfect, but hard to describe unless you've experienced an Indian summer in New England. Smugglers' stables in Stowe are well known, especially in the New England states. And the younger set think nothing of whizzing up from Connecticut or New York to spend an afternoon on horseback. The rates are fairly reasonable, $3 per hour and $4 for lessons. It seems to me that merely riding a horse could get kind of monotonous. It's what you see that makes the ride interesting. For example, the hunters and the hunted. There are rambling brooks, the ever-present carnival of colors, and the hypnotic power of running water. This is Bellow Falls. And listen, take it from Englander, no apple tastes quite as good as a free apple. When I lived in these parts, this wasn't snitching. We used to call it unrestricted hospitality. And unrestricted hospitality is especially fashionable during Halloween when anything that isn't nailed down is liable to be missing. It does taste good, doesn't it? In Vermont, the maple is the state tree, and the state animal is the Morgan horse, named after its breeder, Justin Morgan, of the early 1800s. To reach the Morgan horse farm, you pass under this covered bridge near Middlebury, and you won't be blamed for stopping and taking a few snaps of the bridge in this quiet stream. The Morgan horses bred at the farm are for sale, and at least a few potential buyers are always on hand to size up the prospects. This magnificent colt, Joyous by name, is as green as they come, but in the parlance of racetrack addicts, the horse has a lot of class. Here's a magnificent breed of effortlessly trotting the track. This seven-year-old stud is a canter, and by coincidence, his name is Canter. I'm told by experts that this is almost flawless style. The Morgan Horse Farm in Middlebury welcomes visitors, and there is no admission charge. The Shelburne Museum is as different from ordinary museums as the Maple Museum we saw earlier. It's located on Route 7, seven miles south of Burlington. And once again, a covered bridge is the entry point. But this one is the only double lane covered bridge with a footpath in all Vermont. This outdoor museum sprawls out over an area of 40 acres. It features 33 old fashioned buildings an old steamboat, and numerous other nostalgic reminders. Among the many buildings are an old jail and on the grounds a form of shameful punishment that vanished with colonial times. This reconstructed lighthouse, the Colchester Reef Light, was built in 1871. Vermont doesn't have a coastline, but it does have an authentic lighthouse typical of the many that dot the New England coastline. It takes about six hours to tour this outdoor museum dedicated to memory lane, but a jeep and trailer tour has been thoughtfully added for the foot weary. And here in dry dock, so to speak, is the old steam side wheeler, the Ticonderoga. She dates back to 1906, and incidentally, they show a movie aboard ship describing how the Ticonderoga was hauled overland to this very spot. Well, we have to move along, but do make a note of the Shelburne Museum on your Vermont vacation itinerary, seven miles south of Burlington. We're backtracking now to the town of Bellow Falls, better known as Steamtown, USA. 
and from a distance, the uninformed visitor might mistake it for a small industrial city. But no, Steamtown USA is a huge outdoor attraction devoted to steam trains of yesteryear. And they're all here. Engines, cabooses, locomotives, fire engines, steam rollers, a nostalgic potpourri of steam on wheels. Well, the old timers have no trouble remembering. And as for the youngsters, why, they have all the imagination necessary to play the part of Casey Jones. Borders New York State and the Lake Champlain Ferry services the two shores. There are numerous ferry crossings daily from half a dozen in May to about 18 during the peak of the summer season. Champlain is a small and narrow lake. Crossing from Burlington to Fort Canton, New York lasts less than an hour. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Captain Henry Taft on the motor vessel Valcor, taking you from Burlington to Port Kent, a distance of 12 miles. We hope that you have a very enjoyable trip, and we thank you very much. Here we're passing one of the Valcor's sister ships making the return trip, the Adirondack. And Lake Champlain is as blue as a deep blue sky. Thanks to this excellent ferry service, you can visit two states and enjoy the beauties of the lake and its shoreline, all in the space of an hour. Most vacationers making the crossing continue on, motoring through New York State. But whatever else they may see, they'll not soon forget a delightful autumn in Vermont. More of its hospitable people. At Jocelyn's Woodworking Shop in Barry, for example, we'll learn from Mrs. Elizabeth Jocelyn why it's increasingly difficult for her husband to make the traditional and massive maple table from just one slab of wood. Or perhaps our next visit will find us here during the winter, when the skiing is second to none. During our autumn visit, we scouted some of the better-known slopes from ski lifts, and we can well understand why even people who don't ski Flock here by the thousands to see the mountains and valleys covered with a soft blanket of white. But in any season, winter, spring, summer, or autumn, Vermont is always typically New England. Or as they say in the Vermont travel brochures, this is every man's second state.